that, we'll start with our first talk uh, with Rick Harding, the director of Juju, who will be telling us what's coming up with the roadmap for 2.0 and what we can get excited for. Thanks. Morning, everybody. So, um, how many of you guys have heard of or played with Juju before Config Management Camp? All right. Okay. Good. All right. So. Um, I don't know if you guys realize or not, but we've actually been working on Juju for a while. Um, we've got several years of experience trying to solve this modeling problem, uh, and that's caused us to uh, learn a lot of things and to take those learnings and to do a lot of um, what would we do over again if we had a chance to do it over again kind of updates for 2.0. So 2.0 is really big for us because it's really about taking several years of experience and wrapping it up and putting it to use for our users. Uh, for 2.0, we really focused on four main kind of aspects. Uh, usability, obviously if you're going to provide a tool for people to use, it has to be easy for them to use it, and we had some improvements to make there. Uh, scalability, uh, it's all great that we can go through and do this once on a cloud, but we'll show you some of the new features that really enable you to run Juju at scale. And it's not so much that the workload is at scale, but managing Juju many, many models at scale. Uh, expanding the model, obviously we start out, you know, kind of bring my little application up and run it, that's great, but the reason we moved to this kind of modeling idea is that it's bigger than that. There's more infrastructure involved than just running an application. There are networks involved, there's storage involved, there's other bits of your infrastructure that your ops guy tells you that he has to spend money on that you actually matter when it comes time to managing your infrastructure. And then finally, we really want to improve the charming experience, and you guys have heard a lot about the layers uh, work that has gone on. Uh, it's one of those, again, lessons learned. That's, I think that's like four iterations of how to make charm tooling better, and the guys have finally kicked butt with it. And it's great to see everyone kind of understanding and getting excited about getting into charming with the new stuff. So I'll show you some tools and things around that. So first of all, usability. I come from a web development background and a user experience background, and I am a command line lover. Uh, I, Everyone's supposed to be running like RxVT uh, for their terminal, right? Uh, Tiling window manager. Uh, I think the only GUI tool I usually re use on a regular basis is my browser. Everything else is terminal. Mutt, Ursi. So uh, when it comes to Juju, oh, sorry, actually, I'm going to skip. First thing with usability. If you want to use something, you want to use it in more places. Uh, in particular, Juju 2.0 has two main updates for what we call providers, places you can run and deploy Juju, uh, Juju charms to. Uh, Microsoft Azure is not new, but what is new is their new SDK. Uh, they have a new portal.azure.com, which is kind of their 2.0 Azure APIs, and we support those now in 2.0. The other one is Rackspace. There's a new Rackspace provider so that you can use the Rackspace public cloud to deploy your, uh, your, your workloads with Juju. The other thing that's really interesting, you guys heard about bundles, basically topologies, pulling things together uh, en masse and making it repeatable. Uh, it was in another talk we talked about how if you look at the docs right now, they tell you to use Juju Quick Start. That's been pulled just into the normal Juju Deploy command. You tell Juju to deploy it, it won't ask you any questions, it'll just go take care of it. Whether it's a whole topology, a whole bundle of things that need to run and take a while to do, or just a single thing that you're trying to get out. So uh, this is one of those really big improvements that just smooths over the user experience. So I know people that are running the alpha just so they can type this instead of having to type the Juju Quick Start tool. Yes, question. Oh, you're, <laughs> Preach on, huh? <laughs> All right. Now the slide I was getting to. Command lines. Command lines have user uh, experience, uh, their user interfaces as well, and they need the love and attention they deserve. Um, we took a lot of time and grabbed the whole Juju vocabulary, all the words we use, put them in a nice spreadsheet, split them up by verbs and nouns, and really cleaned up any duplicates. You know, how many people have had, you delete this and you remove that? Oh, man, come on. Tell me what's the difference between delete and remove, right? So we spent a lot of time really cleaning up the CLI experience. In particular, everything's very verb noun. It's all verb dash noun. If there's some kind of noun in the system, some uh, object that you can do, machines, services, units, you should be able to list that noun. If you want to look at one of those or introspect into it, you should be able to show that noun. Uh, and we really kind of took a really measured approach to how the CLI should work from an idea point of view, and then put it into practice. Um, so what you'll find is uh, there's a whole lot of changes across all of the CLI, because it really is, it's redesigned from scratch. So um, again, if you can add something, you should be able to remove it. Uh, and everything's all nice and kind of consistent. So uh, I would love feedback as you play with the alphas and things on the CLI experience. Like, don't be afraid to file a bug that this feels awkward. 
Because one thing we want to make sure is that when you're using Juju, you don't have any of those awkward feeling moments. It should just click and make sense. All right, the Juju GUI 2.0. It's not really part of 2.0. It's released already right now. Um, how many folks have tried out the, the GUI 2.0? Right. Um, I tell you what, the design team and the team that, that, that worked on this really, really hard for a big chunk of time did some awesome work with it. Again, feedback is very welcome. It's you know new launched, and we would love to get you know bugs and ideas for making it better. But if you've not played with the Juju GUI, uh, I highly recommend. It's great for presenting Juju to folks internally. It's great just for visualizing what you're looking at. Like, you know, I'm a CLI junkie, I love it, but the reason you'll find this GUI in all of our material and all the presentations and stuff is because it just resonates with people, they, they look at it and they understand the problem of what's going on, right? This could be, you know, 100 machines, but it may only be five boxes, and really what I care about is, what are those five boxes doing in this model, right? Again, that's when you raise up beyond just bringing up machines and configuring them, you're looking at what are those machines together, what problem are they solving, and that's what we're really trying to take approach of what is this model doing for you today. All right, scalability. So uh, right now, when you Juju Bootstrap, you get a controller and a model. Automatically, no questions asked. You want another one, you have to Juju Bootstrap again. Um, when that actually uh, happens, you end up with a Juju controller that's running, and uh, that's great, it, it, it works, but we want you to be able to kind of take that to the next level. Uh, I don't know anyone in production that runs just one service running at one time, right? You actually have to manage things uh, a lot. So what I want to kind of do is walk through how these, these terms and how this kind of fits together with kind of an example here, okay? So what I've got, ooh, I've got a laser, sweet. Um, we're going to start with step one. Now, we support more clouds than this, but this is what fits on a slide, so forgive me here. Uh, so pick your cloud. I'm going to go ahead and pick uh, LexD, and I'm going to pick Rackspace, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bootstrap some stuff. So I'm going to bootstrap a dev. I can name my, uh, my controller I'm going to bring up, because I want to bring up many of them. I might want to bring up a staging controller and a production controller and keep the models related to those separately and independent possibly even on different clouds or different regions of a cloud. But, you know, imagine you have two open stacks, a, a staging and a production open stack you may want to do, right? So, and that's what I've done here for my Rackspace. I have a Rackspace staging controller and a production controller, and I've, I've named them thus, right, when I bootstrap them. So what happens is, after that bootstrap, I end up with my controller, and the controller is the API endpoint. It's what all the clients talk to. Juju is 100% talks APIs all day, all long. Uh, if you ever want to automate anything with Juju and you're like, oh, I don't have a great command for that or I want to use a library for that, there's an API, uh, get you some documentation and stuff on it. Now, what I've gone ahead and done here is kind of faked out that I've got an HA controller, which means I actually have three different Juju uh, databases running, state servers running, that are tracking all the information about all of the models that are in that controller, okay? But they're all kind of self-contained and they kind of treat as one. So I talk to one and then you know, my client figures out which one of them it wants to talk to, what API endpoint it wants to talk to for the moment, right? All right, so that's great. I've got three controllers, but I haven't actually deployed any work yet. I actually want to get some stuff done. So to get stuff done, I'm going to create models within these controllers. So on my local development one, I want to test to make sure uh, that my CI CD charms are working properly. I'm going to go through and test out our CMS bundle and make sure that uh, my CMS application will, is working properly in my LexD on my laptop. Um, and I actually, as we saw uh, earlier this week, actually deploy all of OpenStack on my laptop in a LexD container so that I can figure out what the hell is up with that HA uh, keystone bug that I was getting reports from in the field. On staging and production, I'm going to make them look very, very much alike because, after all, that's the whole point of staging and production, right? So I'm going to create a model for my CMS app. I'm going to do it in two different regions. So when I create my model, I can ask what region in the cloud I want it in. So this is going to be in London, and this is the Dallas-Fort Worth uh, data center that they've got going on. I'm going to mirror that for my production as well. Okay? So after I run these commands, I'm going to end up with the ability to do something that looks like this. So this is, this is what we're trying to get to here, the models. And this is where the state information for your running workload is actually is, right? Each of those is a model. So, what I've got here is within this one controller running on my laptop, I am actually tracking the state and able to issue commands against all three models that I brought up. Same thing on my rack space with my two here. And obviously, this had to fit on a slide, or else I would have put like, you know, 50 or 100 just to kind of be impressive, but, you know, slides, bam. Yeah, 
That's the model name mean anything though? The model name is, is just for you to address things, right? So what you'll find, and in, in, uh, I can show you in the, the command line experience, you actually uh, switch between models to issue Juju commands. So in, uh, in 2.0, in 1.0, you basically, whenever you juju switch, you're actually switching between the controllers in your environments.yaml, which is actually normally set up per cloud, right? So you would switch AWS, bootstrap something in AWS, and deploy all your stuff in there. With this new way, you actually create the controller, give it a name, um, and you can have many. And then when you put the model in, the model name is, again, that you can switch between within the controller. So it lets you help its folders, basically, right? Keep your stuff organized and in place and have good visibility on what you're actually operating. Any other questions so far? Yeah. So uh, I was under the understanding that one controller would be able to support multiple different um, providers. Yeah. Or uh -huh. multiple different, yeah, multiple different providers. Is so that the case here? No. Or? It's, it's a theoretically possible. We might, we might come back around to that. Um, so, uh, but. You will. In version yeah. three, you will. Right, in, ver in, ver in version two right now, this is what we've got I going. promise you. Um, is, is that you put a controller in each, because at the end of the day, it's going to be interesting to see, like, do you want that kind of latency and stuff across the different providers and things? Because it, you, dude, you have to talk to those state servers, right? Um, it's, that's where all the events and stuff are coming from. And introducing um, that scope of network connectivity, you know, dependency on things that are running in production, it scares me a little bit. Uh, so... Uh, but yeah, no, that's, it's definitely technically possible, and I've definitely heard these ideas tossed around and stuff, but what's implemented is, is this right now. Um, all right, so any other questions? Yeah. So would it be possible to make stretch connections between the models? So that's really interesting. Um, it's something that we'll definitely be looking at. I think a lot of folks would like to be able to you know, look at that kind of feature set. It's not in 2.0. Uh, right now, what you actually would do is via configuration, um, in, in a service, you might say, uh, so let's say I deploy Nagios within a model on a certain controller. Um, I may then go into another model and set some configuration for the Nagios clients that, hey, go talk to your buddy over here and give it the actual address. Um, but then you're outside of, you know, you're not managing it with, you're managing with Juju via config, but it's not as awesome as it could be. So there's room for improvement, no doubt. And so I, I was thinking about it because you were talking about different, um, different areas of, for example, Amazon. Mm -hmm. And so, I, I think it would be better to do it in one model than if, if you're, for example, have a pain over infrastructure mm -hmm. that's in two Amazon regions, mm -hmm. it's better to do it in one model than, than, than one model for each region. So, what I'll challenge you on with that is going to be the, the failover model, right? Because um, at the end of the day, Juju's not going to fail over for you because it's so application specific, right? If Postgres says it, is it a master slave and you need to actually bring up the slave properly and, and hand over? Is it a um, uh, master master, in which case failover is handled a different way? So what you'll find is that things like failover are actually handled within the charms. And as long as the charms have the opportunity and, and the, the monitoring to know what to do and what scripts to run internally or whatnot based on events, normally it's a monitoring event, not a juju event, right? You're not deploying something or adding a unit or whatnot, right? So I, I would say that really the, I definitely see where you're going, but I think when you actually go to do it, you'll find that it's actually outside of Juju that you'll handle that failover process, right? Anything else? Then let's look at the demo. And I'm actually going to cheat. I'm going to demo the GUI first. Uh, well, last minute changes to the slide. So uh, what I've got here is the Juju GUI 2.0. Um, and I've got this deployed on Rackspace. Uh, and what you, the important thing to kind of see here is I've deployed the Juju GUI into, I'm going to have to reload the browser because I VPN and now I've lost my WebSocket connection. All right, so when I bootstrapped, you get what's called the uh, admin model. In this case, it's, it's just named after the, uh, the name you, you call the controller. I call the controller RIX, so the admin model is also named RIX right now. In that, I put the Juju GUI because that admin model is uh, something that you can then anyone can have access to, and you can create multiple users in a controller, and then you can share models in that controller out to users on the system. Okay, so what I could do is in theory I could go and grab. You see, I have a Jenkins and I have a CMS uh, model as well on this controller. I could go in and I could create a user Brad, and then I could share the Jenkins model with Brad, such that he could go to this GUI and log in, and he would see in his list just the Jenkins model, so I can give him access to that. 
The other thing, in, it won't be at 2.0 at launch, but coming up after that, we're working on a read-only view of uh, the whole Juju API space so that I could actually give Brad the ability to monitor and have a read-only view of just the Jenkins model, for instance. And then, obviously, you can go through and switch between them. And here you can see I've got my Jenkins model. It's Jenkins uh, you know, running on port 8080 with my HA proxy. My HA proxy is taking care of the fact that I don't have to specify the port here because it's actually proxying through my 8080 to 80 for my running Jenkins instance from the charm. Um, and what's nice is it's all nice and self-contained. I can control access and uh, logically control modifications to that. And so then here I've got a CMS basically. I've got a Django app running GUnicorn and their Postgres database all wired up. And I could grab my Django app, put it in with this uh, the Django charm and serve out my application. Again, all nice and logically fit together within my CMS model running here on this controller. Is that kind of clicking the kind of controller model layering there that we're talking about? Cool. And then, it's just so pretty. Um, <coughs> all right, so the other thing I wanted to, I wanted to kind of demonstrate was some of the CLI uh, improvements. Um, right now you'll find if you, you grab the 125, you'll get asked to, and you guys probably want to pump for fun. Oh, I failed. See, I told you I'm a keyboard junkie, so I don't, I don't even run control shift plus this. No, it doesn't work for me. You kidding me? <laughs> oh, such fail. Rick, always with you, Tommy, when I'm at You know it. All right. So, um, what I'm going to do through here is I'm going to, in Juju 2.0, I have, uh, oh, I got to set my iPad. Alright. Yay. Alright. So what we did before we gave you like a blank YAML file and we said go in and uncomment out whatever cloud you wanted to use and operate and uh, put it in your credentials and all that kind of stuff. We don't we work that. You shouldn't have to touch any files anymore, right? Like just let me script and put my stuff in and then and, and then don't worry about it. So we have, we pre-populate the clouds that we support with the regions that they are supported. Um, they're in a shared file now on the system so that as you upgrade and update, if there's updates to what we support or there are new clouds available, they'll come down and become part of that file. And so then I can go through and, and this is something that like I, talk about, I can list clouds because hey, so then I should be able to show cloud and look at AWS and I can see the details for the AWS cloud including what actual regions and things are supported, what the authentication type I want to enable would be. Um, what's really great here is, you know what? They just announced a new region of Amazon in Korea, and Juju hasn't quite yet put this out yet. So what you can actually do is tweak this file, you add in the region name and the auth URL, and that day, that minute, you can hop in and bootstrap away on your very own region that's closer to home. I'm going to run to my cheat sheet to make sure that I show the stuff that I'm supposed to show. All right, and then... Obviously, if I have clouds, I want to manage my credentials. My credentials will actually replicate across the regions. They don't need to be tied per stanza in my YAML file. Uh, so we have a credentials file. There's a command to add a credential where you can put it in. There's an auto load. How many of you guys use like Bado or any of like the client libraries to tell you to stick a in a, a .aws file or in, in your home directory or whatnot? Um, Juju will now look for those and auto load them. So that if you're already working with a cloud and you've got credentials in a standard location, it'll find them and pre-populate them into your list of credentials. It's just one less step to getting from I have Juju to I have a running uh, workload on a cloud. And I could, in theory, bootstrap this, except I didn't want to show you guys my computer credentials, so it actually failed. Um, but again, this is where you can see from the command line, I'm actually bootstrapping, I'm going to call it staging, I'm just going to stick it on my AWS cloud. Uh, and by default, there's a default region that you can select, or you could, I could have specified the region afterwards, so I can you know, bring up my controller on whatever region of whatever cloud I want. Hey Rick, why did it fail? Because I didn't actually put my secrets in the file, because uh, it was a demo, and because uh, I don't trust you all. <laughs> 
All right. Juju upgrades. Uh, you heard Mark talk about this, going aerospace. This is Mark's favorite thing, uh, making Juju upgrades aerospace great. And so right now, if you go Juju upgrade, it should work. It'll be awesome. Uh, it takes the controllers in place. And again, the controllers where all the state for all your models are actually held. Um, what we wanted to make sure to do is to find a more bulletproof way of doing an upgrade process sanely uh, at scale with, you know, you got a hundred different models running workloads. You want to make sure that everything's going to go nice and smooth here. So we have to do this in a few different steps in order to sanity check and make this really safe. First thing we're going to do, we're just going to bring out new controllers, right? We're not going to touch your existing infrastructure that's already running. We're going to let that be. We're just going to bootstrap up some new controllers for you, make it HA, and make sure we've got new API endpoints to start to talk to. Then what we're going to do is come back to your original. And we're going to make the juju, not, not the workloads running, they're untouched, right? They're running and they got a little agent on them, but we're going to put all that in read-only mode. Right, so the read-only mode there will enable us to safely perform a migration process without any, any worried changes. Now, they'll queue up on the agents, on the machines that are actually running. Um, that all queue up during this process, but it's going to put that in read-only mode so it's nice and safe. After that, the first, your, your current controllers, one running and operating, will then dump all of their state information and ship it over to your new controller. And then that, when that's migrated over, the new controller will then ask the other one, okay, this is what I saw. Is this what I'm supposed to have seen? And the previous one will say, yes, sir, that matches what I have. And if it doesn't match, the process will safely abort and let you know something happened. Network connectivity issue. Um, I don't know. Some, you know, some, some got, you know, mice in the pipes, buddy. I don't know what happened. Um, but I'm not going to touch your running stuff because it's not safe to do so. I have sanity check that it is ungood. The next thing the new controller would do if all that checks out, it's going to ask all the units on the, from the other controller, hey, do all of you agree with what the boss says? And if they disagree, then it's going to abort because something's out of sync. <laughs> There's some kind of problem between what's actually running and what the state, the original state server thinks it sees. Again, it's not safe. We don't want to migrate. This is risky business, right? So after all that's validated and good, then the new controller will tell all the agents, look at me, I'm the new boss, I'm the man, talk to me, and all the queued events will get shipped across and it'll start picking up and handle from there. And at that point, it'll be safe to then go back and remove the old controllers uh, so that you can then free up the, the hardware uh, resources required for that. So this is us very much taking seriously that when your stuff's running, it's important that it keeps running regardless. Yeah? Does this mean that there is not allowed to have changes during this migration? Not state changes to the underlying. Like you can, the, the system continues to work, but you won't be able to deploy new services add new units, change relations that you might connect or disconnect within that timeline, right? Because any change in the system while they're trying to synchronize this is just an eventual consistency problem that's going to bite you. So, um, any other questions? Make sense? Anyone see a step we missed? All right, cool. Smart people say that we're doing it good. All right, I like it. All right, and this was just kind of my, like, you know, because this is a really big feature. It takes a lot of work. And the team, right before I came out here, sent me this little log file. You can see it created a new model locally. <laughs> It imported the users from the one model to the other, and then uh, the user was imported, it then imported the machines, it verified that the importing of the machine succeeded, and then it marked the actual import as successful. So it's just kind of proof in the log pudding that we're actually getting the first steps of that process in place and validating it along the way. And that's the result of just one upgrade command? This is the result of one upgrade command, yes. The one thing I don't believe we're gonna actually do is remove your old controllers for you automatically, just in case, because you know, if you do want to have any kind of uh, look back or if there is anything, we want to make sure we don't just start tearing stuff down behind you that you might actually find valuable in a debugging or situation. Yeah? So sort of on that point, do the logs go to the new controller as well? Like yes, the so the, the, the logs are actually, um, are, are, are kept and, and sent across. So what I don't remember is if we, I believe we're going to truncate them at some point. I don't know if we keep the whole logs of the whole thing the whole time. Just because you may be like, I just want to run an upgrade, and suddenly realize you've got like 20 terabytes of stuff because of the charms and storage and all that stuff that go across. So there is some shaping of what gets shipped, and that'll be in the documentation uh, once I beat out of the team exactly what it is. So, cool? All righty. All right, expanding the model. So we're now scalable, we're more usable, we're getting more and more awesome each time. Uh, big deal here. Everyone who deploys things has networks, and I'm going to guess you're not just all sitting on a Linksys 
16 port switch, plugging all your crap in, and it's all one flat 192 network or whatnot, right? So you don't deploy your infrastructure that way, uh, you need to be able to manage it. So what we have is we have the idea of spaces in Juju, and spaces are the logical collection of subnets that are under a, like the same security pattern, they're behind the same firewalls, have the same kind of rules and things with them. Um, and we group them this way because it's when you deploy something, it's not always important that it's on this, like, you know, this one subnet. It's that it can talk to the things in this logical space, right? All the DMZ stuff sits in the DMZ. That DMZ may consist of multiple subnets as, as to get me enough IP addresses to house all the crap I've got running. You know, it's, it may not actually you know, be at that specific level. And it's much more logical. So I'm going to add a space here for my databases. Now my databases are going to sit behind a a certain firewall that has much more closed down and probably even some deep packet inspection or something sitting on it. You know, I want to make sure I watch my databases. I'll add a second space for my applications. They're a little bit more crazy loosey-goosey. The developers touch this stuff. I want to keep them away from my databases because developers and databases are great friends in development, but uh, they don't always scale well together. Um, all right, so now I'm actually going to deploy my SQL and I'm going to stick it into my database space, which means that when Juju requests a machine from the cloud, It'll ask it for one that's in the set of subnets that this space was created with. Um, and then when I go deploy my Django charm, I'm going to stick it in my apps space. Uh, and then I'll be able to uh, connect between them. Uh, they can get uh, through the routing and the whatever of between those two spaces is handled by the networking infrastructure. But it then lets me kind of validate that things are put together in the right place. Um, this is supported in AWS with VPC. Um, and this is supported in MAS. And MAS can actually do a lot more work, uh, it can go a step further. So that's great that I can do it on a service, but compl complicated services have complicated networking requirements. Um, I'm gonna demonstrate here Ceph in a minute. Uh, anyone deploy things that have a management interface on one network or one port, and they have like data plane or another network, you wanna keep those things isolated and separate. Um, so it's not enough just to stick the application in one space, you actually wanna associate it all the way down to the connectivity point for that application. So here I'm going to add a space for my control plane, and then I'm going to add a space for my data plane, and then when I deploy Ceph, I'm going to bind anything that talks over the control plane to that space and the data plane to the database space that I created. Um, so within the single service, I've actually split out the network traffic on two different paths. One can go on a you know 1G network. Can you draw that? Uh, actually, sure. <laughs> Good question. I love, nice. I love the plants in the audience. Um, all right, so yeah, so here you go. Ceph, anything that comes across in the data plane is going to go out on this dot ten. Anything that goes in the control plane will go on this dot zero. Those can be two separate switches. One can be a ten G network. One a one G network. Uh, and I can properly manage my infrastructure, as all good practices tell me I should, and still maintain the higher level modeling visibility and control that Juju offers me. Any questions on that? Yeah. This needs to be supported in Charm, right? Yes. So what happens is, again, um, what's great about the Charms and the spaces and the expanded modeling is, by default, the, the Charm will say, I can support these config options, right? So the Charm says, I have a control uh, point that I can connect. I have a data plane point that can be connected. If you just do, do, do deploy the Charm, it'll grab a network and it'll stick them both in the same network, right? So it falls back gracefully, it works across clouds, the charms don't get locked into only working in one place or one or, or the other. I can still test this locally with my LexD provider, right? Um, but what it grows is the ability when it gets to production, you want to production grade. And as much as you know, we want to say we want to make development the same, there just comes a time when things have to stay running that they add monitoring bits, they add HA, they add things that are just going to be different. So we want to make sure it's very, you know, works properly across that whole gamut for you. Um, but anyway, so the charm will declare this definitely, and the charm author has to support it when it, if it gets multiple uh, bindings in, then it will actually handle that at the configuration level of the application. Cool? Any other questions? You look confused, man. Oh, yeah. So can you have more than two uh, plays? As many as you want. Um, it's, it's basically set up per inner, so, when you create a charm, we talked about the requires and the provides, those interfaces that you have there. Um, any one of those can be bound to any space that you would like to bind it to. Right? So the charm can support that is what we're saying. All right. Yes? Uh, you elaborate a little bit on the distinction on how that's used with different, between different providers. 
So like the math, let's say math versus yep. AWS. Sure. Um, so right now the only provider that supports this per endpoint binding is MAS. Um, we find that the primary use case of this is, like right now we're developing it for our OpenStack charms particularly, so that the OpenStack control network and the data networks are completely separated. Storage is separate than even the data network for your compute and such, right? So that's, that's like our driving use case through that we're proving all this through with, okay? Um, on AWS, we support spaces, put this service in this space, but not at the per binding level. Um, we want to come back and enable that as a follow-up, um, now that we've proven it in as in our primary use case, we, we, we test it all, make sure it all works properly. Um, other providers will have to be you know, updated. This is where it gets to be a little bit fun. We want to be as agnostic as possible, but it, it, there always comes a time when a provider will support something, like Amazon has better, you know, has, has maybe more thorough network controls and some of the other providers that we may also work with and offer, right? Awesome. Uh, so, if Spaces is a functionality, on the AWS provider, though, mm -hmm. correct? So yes, in 2.0. Oh, okay, so then what, uh, what, what's the difference between... So in, in AWS, I could say deploy stuff into the data bit space, but I couldn't separate out the control network in AWS right now. Right. We'll come back to that, though. Like that, I mean, it's, we, we definitely want to come back. Yeah. How much of this would be supported in the manual provider? So that's an interesting question because in the manual provider, um, we're talking, we're talking, well, in the manual provider. Sorry, I was thinking like Steve. In the manual provider, how much would be supported? Um, I don't know. I haven't thought about that one. So the way, reason Maz works really well is because Juju talks to Maz. Uh, Maz has been updated to be able to tell Juju about the networks it knows about, right? Notice in here, I didn't tell Juju about all the subnets, right? Because I told Maz, which knows all the underlying infrastructure, all the actual hardware, the machines, the switches and stuff, is all, is all in Maz. And Maz is telling that to Juju, so Juju says, okay, well based on that, I can work with that. This is good, right? So for a manual provider situation, we would have to look at how we would be able to add that metadata into the manual provider in such a way that then Juju could know and understand it, or, or we'd have to look at adding support in Juju for telling it about the networks and stuff that you have available because it's manual. Right. Yeah, we, we have a similar thing like the um, the digital ocean provider. Yep. Where we wrap Juju, mm -hmm. and so we have that information. We could provide it in a way if if there was a way to provide that information in manual. Yeah, uh, if you're interested in this, um, I mean, it's open source project. We have a team that handles the networking stuff because it can be a little mind bending at times, to be honest. So we have some experts, uh, most of them are in Europe or whatnot. I will happily put anyone interested in and playing with trying to add support with the networking team. Uh, they'd love to chat with you guys and, and we would love to kind of grow support for this uh, more widely. And again, open source contributions, you know, come hack with us, man. It's a lot of fun. And the second question is, how would this integrate with containers? Again, the same thing with the containers. My question would be, so like in LexD world, um, what would I use to manage my networks, my virtual networks and things in the LexD world? And then, um, get that subnet information up to Juju, I haven't thought about it yet. Um, yeah. So is this a thing with LexD as well? Also, I was about saying, it's not implemented right now. We'd have to think about how to, in a LexD world, you, I mean, you normally you go in and you put your, your network information in as like part of the, the template for the LexD file again config. And so you have to figure out like, how do I get that config out to be able to tell Juju about the networks that are used across that I might want to use. I don't know, it would take a little bit of love. So it, it needs some design and some engineering effort. So, I don't know, it's, this is awesome, great shiny 2.0, it is not, we're not done yet. We'll, we will be working on this for a, a ways to go still, for sure. Alrighty, any other networking questions before we go on? Because, no, it's not like that. Hello, right here. Hello. Yeah, oh, sorry. How is this implemented on a per unit level? So, on a per unit level, I mean, basically the, the service is configured, and okay, so you get a machine provision, when the machine's provision, uh, Juju tells Maz, Maz, I need a machine that is on these networks. So when Maz actually then uh, provisions the machines, it sends across uh, curtain and cloud init, basically, it makes sure that the network config, the ATSI interfaces, is properly set up with the network configuration available. And Maz tells that to Juju when it hands it the machine. Here's the networking you know, metadata, basically. And then on the unit, when the hook runs, like all the hooks still fire. So when you're writing your layers, you can from your layer write, you know, network get and get for the interface. 
and then it tells it, here's the networking you know, metadata blob about what uh, IP address, you know, sitter, subnet, all that stuff that you're supposed to be sitting on, and then the, the unit of the charm, you know, the charm that's being deployed, that unit, can then determine how I write that out to whatever application I'm trying to configure. So in the case of Ceph, it goes in and writes out the Ceph configuration files on where to stick its data network config based on the information from the network guest, the network get command, run in the hook. shell script. Um, it's going to go through, uh, the Ceph charm supports three different uh, endpoints. There's the monitoring endpoint, the cluster endpoint, and the public endpoint. And then I basically have a juju run command that goes and asks the Ceph uh, unit, uh, zero unit, do me a favor, tell me what address you're sitting on. Right? So, nice, cheap. And juju says, Winner! All right, so notice monitoring is on a 168, cluster on a 184, and public on a 187. And this will be true of all the units of SEP, so just to kind of give you the look of the actual. Uh, so then here you can actually see I've got three different nodes of SEP running. I had queried zero, I can query one and two and get the network information of each of the endpoints of each of the units. Um, but what's nice is that as I script it, really what I'm doing is I'm, I'm telling Juju about spaces and I'm letting the network configuration be agnostic to each person's implementation of whatever it is. So it's never, nothing hard coded and it, it helps us keep things nice and reusable um, within things like bundles, uh, the charms themselves, and so on. Alrighty. <coughs> charmers. Who are my charmers in the audience? Come on. Yay. Hey. Would you guys like to charm easier and better? Yay. <laughs> All right, <laughs> we have a thing called, we've been calling it Charm Publish. Um, so we really want to help build out the Charm uh, community. Uh, charms are just software projects. And the more and more we write Charms, the more and more we realize we need software development tools to manage our Charms, to provide testing infrastructure, to make sure that things are working and to help people collaborate. So Charms are software. What we want to do is right now you'll find that people will tell you to get your Charm in the store to go stick a branch in a launch pad, and that launch pad branch will get pulled in eventually. Uh, a long time later, and painful, and then people go, oh, I'll just keep it local, and I won't share with the world, and I'll be greedy and keep all my cool code to myself. Um, we want you to share it out more and collaborate more. So what we've actually done is let you keep your charms wherever you like. The charm, there's a new charm command that will allow you to actually push your current directory up to the charm store and automatically revision. Uh, and what's nice about that is it means you can keep your charms in GitHub and Launchpad and your own private VCS because your company won't let you like go get that GitHub corporate account uh, and you can manage your charms however you wish locally, but still get them out, share them with the world, collaborate, you know, pool together everyone's operational knowledge and make these charms and services better and easier to run. The other thing we've added is the idea of a development channel. So when you first upload uh, or push your charm up to the store, you'll find that no one can see it or play with it yet, and that's because everyone's first push is never what will actually go out and deploy. It's, uh, I think this might work, or I want to say this for later. Uh, so we actually have support for a whole development channel so you can work on the charm while leaving a published, working, uh, stable branch, basically, out in the store for people to find and see. Now, because this is in the store, what's great is that you can actually then collaborate on the development branch of charms with other people, just like you would another software project, right? You know, and not everyone's going to come and hack on the code, but you want people to be able to go get it and try it out. Um, and then finally, the, the last thing you want to do then is once you have test that says this development charm, uh, this development branch of the charm that this revision passes all the tests, then you can go in and actually publish it and it gets whoop, moved up to the publish stream and everyone can now charm upgrade and get the new hot awesomeness that you've added support for, you know, networks, endpoint uh, connectivity. So the way this will work out is basically charm push to my charm store URL. I actually better give it a message about what, what this actually does. Uh, because again, you're managing your charm however you want. You may end up having five or six local commits of your charm of the actual source code. But what you want the people who are reading the who are seeing the charm to see is what did I do in these five things, right? Maybe it took me five commits 
to add new configuration support to the charm, and then to get the test to pass that, that the new configuration took hold and operated correctly. They don't need to see all that stuff. People that want to get the charm just want to know what's different from the one I have running right now. Oh, you added a new configuration value. Awesome, thank you. So go edit the metadata. Um, this was an example of where I was going to add a new series support, or I have to do the description, sorry. Uh, I go ahead and git commit, I update in my git, and then I actually then push again, and notice that I go from revision zero of the charm to revision one of the charm, because I added some new info. Yeah. So it's, it's push, not upload? Yeah, well, or push, not upload. not upload, yes. So we, um, this is in, in alpha right now. Um, there is a uh, PPA that you can get that has the actual charm commands that you can run and operate against. You'll find the commands aren't quite in sync, as Tim points out, because uh, we showed this to some internal testers two weeks ago or whatever in, in Cape Town, and we got some good feedback, and the team is taking that feedback in and applying some changes. So again, if you want to be early in and help, uh, you know, help scope and help work on you know, really shaping the, what is usable and useful and works for you guys, now's a great time to jump in and provide feedback while the team has a chance to tweak and, and get changes and stuff in before the 2.0 release. Uh, and then finally, the last step, now that I've got it in development and I've added my new thing, I can then go in and publish it and that becomes, notice the lack of the development section of the URL here that, that lets me know that this is not the development charm that I'm actually going to get. Um, also note, this is all in my namespace. Everything is, is namespaced here. Uh, so you can work on your stuff independently. As your charm becomes like the charm, when you have like the Postgres charm because it is so awesome and quality and it is the the, what we call the recommended version has gone through the community review process. They've made sure that everything looks on the up and up, that you don't have any really bad missing corner cases or missing tests. Uh, then you can actually even swap out the whole namespace and you can just, that's when you get to just Juju deploy PostgreSQL, right? Any questions or any of that make sense or frighten anybody or they get excited yet? So what you're saying is I don't have to learn Bazaar now? No, you don't have to learn bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Rick, at CS colon, wasn't that a bizarre shortcut? No. No, no that's oh. a Juju shortcut. That's a charm store. A whole new set of shortcuts. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, yeah, so the CS colon, it's a good point, right? So CS colon is a charm store. You can deploy this stuff all locally as well, right? So we need kind of key identifiers to help know when I say Juju deploy something or Juju do something, do I mean this folder sitting right here in front of me? Do I mean this remote endpoint over here? You know, what the hell are you talking about, right? And so it's basically, consider that the alternative to HTTP, you know, or HTTPS. Well, do I need to, do I need to go to the charm store and reserve my, my, my IRC handle or my, my namespace? How are, how are the namespaces sure. getting assigned? The namespaces are allocated based on your Ubuntu SSO login. So yes, oh, okay. if you have an Ubuntu SSO login from anything, any canonical account for anything, then you already have a namespace reserved for yourself. And if you want a cool hot name that someone hasn't taken yet, then you should go to uh, login.ubuntu.com and go claim one for yourself now. Thank you. All right. All right, next up, charming, multi-series charms, yay! Uh, so, <laughs> uh, basically this is adding um, the metadata field here, series was always just a value, which meant, that's great, Rick, but my charm works across three different Ubuntu series. And I don't want to maintain three different code bases for those charms because it just freaking works. If app gets installs a package, it configures it, it runs. Hey. Uh, so what we actually do is allow you to supply a list. Uh, and the first one on the list is the default. So if I were to just juju deploy Postgres, then it would just deploy to Xenial because that's the default one on the list. I can always specify uh, series as a flag. And I believe I have, so here, juju deploy just my charm, let's go Xenial. If I specify it, I can tell it I want the precise series. And if I do it locally, same thing. I can deploy locally, have the multiple series support, and tell it which one I want to actually go out. All right, so it just simplifies from the experience of maintaining the charm. Uh, the one caveat I will say is what we don't allow, we mean we support Windows, CentOS, and Ubuntu. We don't allow one charm to work across, across distros, just because um, at that point, you have so many like if def equivalents all throughout your freaking code to handle all the different OS variations that it makes the charms a bit more brittle uh, and uh, harder to use, let's say, uh, to test and debug. Yep. Uh, is this still a way from using the local colon prefix? Totally. No local colon prefix is required because if basically if you dot slash something, we know it's a directory, right? That's what yeah. Linux says to do, right? Like all Unix tools. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> Imagine that. 
Um, and as well as, you know, you don't have to keep a directory structure of the different series and stuff involved. So, uh, <laughs> you can tell the people who have written some charms in here, they're starting to smile up in the back of the room. <laughs> All right. All right, our next big thing, and this is a really big one, and I'm, I'm really excited about this one. Uh, so, Rick, that's great. I've got a charm, and it's a chunk of code, but I've got an application over here in a separate repo, and it's a separate chunk of code, and I work on them and release them independently, right? I may cut a 2.0 release of my CMS application, and it still works with the same dippy charm I had yesterday. Um, and so our answer to that um, has been suboptimal until 2.0. In 2.0, what we actually do is we separate out the idea of resources a charm relies upon from the charm itself. So the charm just says, hey, I take, uh, this was an example for the Juju GUI charm that we're going to be working on here. The Juju GUI charm is a JavaScript HTML CSS application that just talks across a WebSocket, right? So we build up a giant tarball of compressed JavaScript and stuff, and we want to ship it along with the charm whenever it deploys so that the charm can be deployed offline, right? I don't want to have to, I, I can go get from GitHub as a config option, but out of the box, if you're on your local machine and you grab the charm, I just want it to work, right? So what we do is we declare in our metadata.yaml a resources uh, section. We declare the name of the resource. In this case, it's the actual Juju GUI source. Um, it's a file, and then we give it a file name so that we can predict what to see it on inside the charm when I'm running my hook, and I go to grab that file. I want to know what, what to call it. Um, and then basically I can give a description so that when you go to the store and look at things, you'll see the list of resources and go, okay, it supports these resources, and what the heck is jujigui.tgz? Well, it's the source build, right, for our metadata. So that's great. Step one, I declare the resource. Now I want to actually deploy. Rather than sticking that resource into my charm, committing it, and pushing large blobs up into uh, my git tree, I maintain it separately. I can actually just juju deploy my resources, and here what I'm doing is I've got a, uh, a nightly build that I want to test out. So I'm deploying my charm from the store, the current stable charm, but I'm running a nightly resource, like my nightly build of the Juju GUI, so that I can automate my test infrastructure to say, hey, if I were to deploy this in production today with my current charm, would the test pass, mm -hmm. right? And so by separating out the resources independently, it gives us a lot of flexibility uh, and it lets us follow a lot of good development practices that are a lot harder to do today. So I'm in my hook, I'm writing my charm. I can now set status that I'm receiving my source code because maybe it takes a while to get. I don't know, it could be coming across the internet from GitHub, I could be pulling it from a, uh, the releases page on GitHub or something like that. Uh, I then run resource get with the name of it. Um, I then do stuff with it. In this case, I would untar it, stick it in a directory. Uh, I might run a build step or something if I want to actually, you know, run make or something on it on top of that. And then finally, I would then update my status of my current service to say I'm now running and operating properly. Adam. Uh, does the resource system have any ways in the verification? Make sure that you download the wire Catherine, awesome person who's working on the resources. So if you want to talk to her about resources, she is your master of uh, ceremonies there, nods her head yes. yes. I always yeah. defer to the person writing the code. Uh, I believe yes. <laughs> um, you can have multiple resources. Uh, you can stick them in the store. They get development channel just like the charm itself. So uh, whenever you publish the charm up to the store, you can supply default resources, but we allow you to then do things like local overrides. You may have three resources. Two of them, you're okay with the ones that are in the store, but you want to test the third one again about testing, if I change this, do all my, does my CI process still pass, right? We let you kind of have all that flexibility that you may want. Questions, make sense, sound awesome? This is good stuff, yeah. I'm just curious to follow up on that. Sure. Um, how is it checksum? Like, is it just a SHA, or is it like a GPU, or is it like TLS? Cool. Alrighty, so that's going to bring me to the end of 2.0, and I ran over a little bit. Yeah. So on resources, if you push them into the charm store, will you, does it get renamed to the thing that you had to the, meta, the, to the file name and that you showed in the metadata? Yeah. It'll get... It, how, do you, how do you query and see what, what version you currently... Sure, um, so there's a whole uh, spec on the resources work. Um, there are commands such as list resources, like resources and noun. So anything you should expect to do with any other noun, like risk, list resources, show a resource will give you all the data about the resource. It'll tell you what revisions. What it turns into is when you actually publish a charm, you're not going to just publish the charm at revision 20. What you're going to say is like CI says the charm revision 20 plus the GUI source code at revision 103 
pass all CI tests. That, that tuple, we call it the, the revision set, is what I want to actually publish to the world. So if someone were to just go Juju Deploy, Juju GUI, they should get that resource with that charm together because I have told uh, Juju, I've told the charm store, these two are known to work together, right? And so as far as the renaming process, when you run resource get, it's, it, I don't know if it's in Juju itself when it gets the file or if it's in the store when it stores a file. Let's call it implementation detail that you don't have to worry about. Catherine's got your back. Yeah. Um, in 2.0, there's the offline deployment stuff for like non connected uh, platform. Is there a way if you have a, like, if you build a model on a platform that is connected to the internet so you build and deploy it, is it possible to take that model and say, okay, I want to take everything offline, bundle it up, and then be able to deploy it offline without going to pay for a specific chance to chance? So, uh, if you deploy something into an online model and it fetches stuff from the charm store, all the resources are, are, are inside the storage of that model. Um, now, the question is, could I migrate that over to a non-disconnected one? Um, no. You could probably pull all the, the stored blob data over the API, perhaps? Like, it might be something we could script. Catherine wants to... So, so when you do resource get, it's actually... I, I look at it like an L1 cache and an L2 cache. Your LT cache is the charm store. Your L1 cache is the data store of your portal. So when you do resource kit, it's actually pulling it from the charm store into your controller. Right, but if I want to take it to another controller, right? If I want to then migrate that off to an offline um, mass deployment, for instance, right? We would have to think of or, or have a, right. some kind of tool to help you dump that stuff out of the controller to be able to then have it so that when you deploy, you can point to your local resources and, and deploy it a second yeah, time. So it's it's not impossible, but it would need some it needs some you know engineering effort required there. Yeah. I was under the impression, and maybe I should change some of my slides. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that not only fetch a resource from a store, yeah, but you could at deploy time specify that instead of using a store resource. Well, no, that's exactly no, that's fine. So we're talking, you he's talking about cache the resources locally. You might well, but what he's saying is, I have a deployment. I want to mirror that deployment. I didn't. I don't want to rescript fetching all the stuff from the store into a directory. Oh, right. Okay. So he's, he's skipping the stuff you're saying. That you're good. I got your back. I just let down this poor guy. So yeah, I'm taking care of you, and now he's not happy, man. See what I got? Okay. All right. We'll work on it. There's always room for improvement, right? If, otherwise, we'd all go home and stop working. But this is too much fun. So, any other questions? Yeah. So uh, I, I deploy a Juju environment, and then I need to share it with the team of developers. Sure. Uh, there's a multitude of ways to go about like getting their sensitive information to them, right? And yeah, so we have a cool trick for that in 2.0. I'm so proud of this one. This is one of my favorite things I asked for, and the team is making it happen, and I love them so much. Um, all right, so in the new 2.0 CLI, in the spec that they're working on with that list clouds and all that stuff, right? So when you, you create a model, you juju add user. You can juju add user, and when you do that, it generates a single command. Uh, it's uh, Juju add model, I think, and then it specifies a one-time password flag. So all I send to that new user, I say, run this command on your system. So if they app get install Juju and run this one line with a one-time passphrase, like shot up little bit of blob, then that will then talk to the controller, log them in, find out anything they have access to, cache all the information Juju needs to talk to that controller and the models and stuff locally, without the user having to worry about it. It's a one frickin' liner. Nice. And I'm like, ka-ching, ka-ching, baby. Just, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, this is what I mean about trying to scale up Juju, because you know it's great to have it work from your system. But you know I would like to take a vacation or a holiday once in a while, too. <laughs> and when I do, I don't want to have to give everyone all my secret crap, right? Or give them my laptop. Here, please take care of my job for me while I'm away. All right, no good. That is awesome. Thank you. All right. I, I'm glad you asked. I'm so proud of that. Like, it's, I can't wait. The first time I do it, I'm going to do a happy dance with you. No, tomorrow. All right. Sorry. As you can might tell, I'm a little excited about this stuff. This is, um, you know, really good thing. So, any other questions? Concerns? Wish list. Rick, why don't you do? Well, wish list. Uh, OS X credentials. Currently, you are not supported. Yeah, so we... Uh, we have a bug file. It's something, 
we run Ubuntu all day, we do support some stuff on OS 10, but let's just say we're not the heaviest users and things like that slip through the cracks. So we have a bug for that, we'll definitely be investigating, because um, it totally, it, it should be supported for a good user experience. It's a it should be a requirement for us as part of the user usability uh, update, so. Um, Where I'm from, from Amsterdam, everyone runs OS 6 on their own. No doubt, I, I look around the room and I, you know, actually, I would expect to see actually a little more. It's looking more half and half right now. But I, I totally understand. And again, this is why we do builds and things on OS 10. We make sure the client stuff supports. It's a bug. We'll, we got to get it fixed. Okay. Well, and then uh, anti affinity. What's that? Anti affinity. Anti affinity in, in what way? Well, that you, you can specify you want, you want multiple machines not on the same uh, VM, physical machine, uh, rack, okay. drone, provider. Sure. Um, so Juju naturally takes the uh, advantage of uh, availability zones. Uh, in Azure, it used to be called availability sets or something, and now it's called something else in the new provider. Juju will try to make sure that as it deploys units, that it spreads them out across within that region, uh, the zones within it, so that it automatically tries to keep them away. Now, uh, for OpenStack, we can do that with you declare kind of your different OpenStack regions, I believe. I'm going to get the terminology wrong. Who's from OpenStack here is going to correct me? Yeah, what the, the availability zone you mean? Yes, availability zones, right. So it'll, Juju will automatically try to, as you add a unit, it will make sure that they're spread across availability zones within that region for you to help with that automatically. Now, if you do it manually or locally or whatnot, there's just no such thing, so it just drops them out. Yes. Oh, very good. So you cannot specify it's automatic? Uh, no, when you add unit, Juju just does, it tries to be smart about it. Um, it's not something, I mean, would you, so I take that back. Whenever you deploy or add a unit, you can always tell it, go get on this machine, right? Um, if you Juju deploy, uh, I can always say dash dash two machine, one, two, three, four, five, whatever machine Juju knows about. So you can always specify exactly where you want something to go, um, but that requires then that you have to then know about the machine. Um, so, you know, here actually, let me, this is one of those better shown demonstration modes. So here I have my services. I can go into machine view in my GUI here. I can actually go in and add a machine, and I can tell it what kind of machine I want. And then I'm going to scale up my uh, Postgres with another unit. I would like to. All oh, right, it's not any longer provider. <laughs> is I can actually manually add a machine, grab a service. On that machine, I can actually add a container. So let's add a KVM container, uh, whatever constraints. And then I can take my service, and I can actually stick it onto the container in question. And then notice it's calling the container new zero. It's a new, new machine, uh, KVM, and it's new one. It's, it's the first KVM instance on that machine. So, um, I noticed here, this is an example of me scaling Jenkins by manually telling Juju exactly where I want it. Um, just normally, you don't want to do that level of custom manipulation for every single unit of every single service, because it might go a little monotonous. So by default, Juju will try to spread out, but you have complete control to stick it. If you know where you want it, stick it where you want it. Okay. Thank no you. problem. All right. Any other questions? Sorry, I'm taking up all your guys' time. Can you quickly touch on uh, provider storage support? In what way? In the way of what's supported where on what provider. Oh, 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 the storage. Oh, I don't have a storage person here to back me up. See, this is the manager okay, being no, in trouble. No so uh, I, I know we support EBS and, and things on AWS, yeah, um, on Maz and on, I thought there was a third provider that had good storage support. Oh, open, OpenStack itself? Yeah. Okay, so right, OpenStack itself, Maz, and, uh, and AWS, I know we have decent support for creating pools out of EBS volumes. At certain IOPS, you can have slow and, and fast you know, EBS volumes, and then you could 
give, give to the services so that when they come up, they can say, I want to stick my logs on this storage and my database on this storage and all that. So um, there's some really good documentation on that. And it, you know, grab people in a lab and sit down and try it out. And let me know if it works for what you need. If it doesn't work for what you need, come tell me. Um, I really do, like, I'm very passionate about this. I want Juju to work for people. And it's when people come and tell me, oh, it should do this. And I go, let me get that on the roadmap. Um, and we, you know, we're coming up at 1604 in April here with the release of this. We're all going to sit down together at a sprint after that and look at the roadmap for the next six months. And, you know, let us know something that, that you really need or would, would desire. And I can see what I can do on getting it on the plan for the next six months. So come October, you'll have an even fancier, awesomer, better Juju that'll do more stuff for you than it did when, it, when you first got it, right? You want your car to get better over time, right? Not just appreciate it. All right, any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much again. I'm Rick. Um, grab the Canonical folks, tackle them. We're here for you guys today. Uh, so, you know, use and abuse it. But if you have questions afterwards, hit us up on the mailing list, the IRC channel. Um, again, you know, we're here to help you guys do awesome stuff. Cool, thank you.